All right, well, we've already read about Christ's crucifixion. Let's read now about his resurrection. And just a reminder again that the text we're looking at really is the meditation, but uh, this, this is the account of this is the event. And uh, what we're looking at in our text is the, the, the doctrine, the, the, the theology, the significance of the resurrection. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this morning, of course, we're looking at the resurrection of Christ. And again, we're reminded that this is something that is absolutely essential to our salvation, to our justification. Now, we, we know, uh, we've been reminded on numerous occasions, really, hopefully, of all these things, but we, we know particularly how important the crucifixion is. The author to the Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And remember, even those sacrifices made in the Old Testament under the ceremonial system, even those sacrifices could not take away sin, except as the offerer, look forward to the sacrifice of Christ. It's always been only that which makes any sacrifice efficacious and makes it effective to forgive sin. The blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, which is why Christ had to give his life. So we know the importance of his crucifixion, and we also know how much we need his obedience. You know, the, the Lord requires perfection if we are to enter into heaven. And Jesus obeyed the law perfectly, the Ten Commandments, the law of love, so that he might give to us a spotless record. But the question we're asking this morning is, why do we need the resurrection, and why can we not be saved without it? Okay, that's what I want us to consider. Now, let's begin, and again, I'll just refer you to the text, because we're going to essentially be looking at the meditation. Let's begin where Paul does in this passage, by looking at why it is we need salvation, what it is that Adam did to us. I know we're familiar with this, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded and to remember that these things are real, okay? What he did to us actually happened. And what he did was actually imputed to us and it actually did kill us. And that's what put us in the predicament we were in. Now, first, I just want to point out that uh, the two verses we're looking at are arranged in a, a, a fairly specific way. 
And this, what we have in front of us, is an example of um, perhaps the most common form of what's called Hebrew parallelism, which I hope we're all familiar with by this time. Let me just remind us, okay? The Hebrew thought often used this pattern where they make a statement. They say, you know, something. They make a proposition. And then they state it again, but they, they state it more strongly. And uh, my Old Testament prof, even though this is the New Testament, these are still Jews that are speaking, and they still think along these lines, okay? So he put it this way. It's pretty simple. A, you know, he says statement A. What's more, B, okay? So you state one proposition, and then you sort of heighten it a bit, and you state it again. Well, that's what Paul is doing here. Notice Paul says first in verse 21, by a man came death, okay? Because of what Adam did, death entered into the world, okay? People began to die. And then in verse 22, in Adam all die, okay? Now, what he's done here is he's intensified it a bit. Death not only came into the world and affected some, but death has universally killed all of Adam's children, including us. By the way, I should have mentioned there's actually two sets of thoughts, you know, two ideas here that are being parallel. This is just simply the first one, okay? And that is Adam brought death into the world and everyone was killed. Now, the question is, how did this happen? Well, again, this is where covenant theology comes in. This is our understanding of what the Bible teaches about the arrangement that God made. Remember that God made Adam like himself. Okay, not absolutely, but in many different ways. Most importantly, God made Adam with a heart that loves what is good. Okay, he made him morally upright so that God could have a relationship with him, so he could have fellowship with him, not because God needed it, but because he chose it and it, it, it pleased him to bless man with, with that fellowship. Well, we also know that when God made Adam and he made Eve, that he blessed them so that they could multiply and fill the earth. By the way, I just I thought about that as, um, you know, as I was preparing this particular message. And I was wondering, how many people are there in the world today? Well, you know, it, it, there's 8 billion people in the world today, 8 billion people. And that shows us that the blessing of multiplication is, is still there. God is still blessing mankind with the ability to procreate. And uh, so that didn't go away with the fall, but certainly he blessed Adam and Eve with that. That's where it began. He also gave them the task of subduing the earth. And this is something we don't think about very often. What does that mean, subdue the earth? What's, what's wrong with it? Well, the idea is this is called the cultural mandate, and what it means is that God gave Adam and Eve the task of um, making the earth bring forth the things it, it could potentially bring forth to the glory of God. Well, in those days, it was, it was primarily working the soil in, in the garden and making it produce, you know, the, the produce of the garden, but we do know it's much more involved than that. You know, mankind is still pursuing the task of subduing the earth. And that's why so many new things are being discovered all the time because God is giving man the ability to take what the earth is, what's in the earth and make it, you know, yield what it can, uh, it, its potential. I mean, who'd have thought, you know, if you're Adam standing in the garden, who'd have thought that a widescreen TV could come out of that or a uh, a computer or an automobile, you know, but these are the things that we are discovering. But the, the difference today, of course, is that man no longer does it for the most part for God's glory. Now, he gave Adam also the responsibility of ruling over the earth. Uh, he was God's deputy, what's called his vicegerent, the one who would uh, act on his behalf under him. And as a part of that, he also gave him the even greater responsibility of guarding the garden. And this is something, again, I think is almost completely missed in evangelical circles, that when God told Adam that he was to, um, uh, what he was to do in the garden, uh, the, see the terms, what are they, to, to work the ground, to, to keep it, to keep it, I think is the word that's used, that the word keep doesn't mean just tend doesn't mean just work the soil. 
but it actually means guard the garden. Originally, heaven and earth, when God created it, were actually together, okay? Heaven is represented in the Bible as being on earth at the time of Adam and Eve on a mountain that was in the Garden of Eden. I think we talked about that recently. God dwelt on the mountain with his holy angels while Adam and Eve lived below in the garden. And what that means is the Garden of Eden was God's sanctuary. It was essentially, again, heaven on earth. And Adam's task was to protect it from intruders, protect it from anything unholy. Now, sadly, he failed. God gave them the test, as you well know, to see if they would obey him, if they would repel the intruders. He gave them a test of pure obedience. He showed them all the trees of the garden and said you could eat of any of these trees, but here's one tree that you may not eat of. And there was nothing unique about that tree except God said, don't eat from that tree. Again, a test of pure obedience. Are you going to listen to me? Um, and he told them if they did, he gave them a warning that they would die. So this was the test. Don't eat of the tree. If you do, you will, you will die. Well, we know that God allowed an intruder to enter into the garden. Again, Lucifer was on the holy mountain and he was, became evil because of pride, cast off the mountain in the garden, comes to Eve, tempts her and tempts, well, she falls and then tempts the man. The point is, they didn't repel the intruder, but they listened to him instead. They disobeyed God, they failed the test. Now, if they had obeyed, what would have happened? they would have continued to live. Remember, there was another tree in the garden, the, the uh, tree of, of life, and that tree represented what they would receive if they had passed the test, which would be eternal life. They would have continued to live. They would have had children. And as a family, they would continue to do the cultural mandate. They would multiply. They would fill the earth. But only in this case, the garden would expand, and it would eventually fill the entire world and then when everyone was born that was going to be born, God would have taken them into the next stage, which would be the eternal state. But we know that didn't happen. They disobeyed God, and God judged them. Now, one thing we need to remember about God in order to understand the importance of the atonement is that God is absolutely pure. He is absolutely holy. He loves everything that is good and right. He is one who must punish sin. That's why God is just. There's a connection between what something deserves and whether it actually gets it. Okay? God loves righteousness and he hates sin. And when he sees sin, he must judge it. And that's the reason why God never makes an idle threat. Everything he says he, he will do, he does. He said, if you eat of that tree, you will die. And that's what happened to Adam and Eve. The curse of death fell on Adam and Eve. Now, we know they didn't die right away. We know of God's mercy and grace and, and redemption and so forth. But they began to age. They died physically. They, again, they began to age and they would eventually die. They died spiritually, which means that they lost the love that they had for the Lord. God's spirit withdrew from them. The next time they see the Lord, they hide in fear from Him. Something's changed, right? They, they were exposed and they realized they were exposed to God's judgment. They no longer had the righteousness they had before. And they came under the sentence of eternal death and damnation. So instead of staying in the sanctuary of God and that sanctuary growing till it fills the entire earth, God cast them out of the garden. They could no longer be in the garden because they were unholy and God cannot allow anything unholy in his presence. The garden, you know, you've, maybe you've asked the question, I wonder where that garden is today. <laughs> you know, if I, if I went searching over in that area and I found where all those rivers are, would I find, you know, Eden? Well, no, because God removed heaven from the earth. Now the two are separate. The work of redemption is actually to bring them back together. So God cast them out, heaven and earth were separated, Adam and Eve were separated from God uh, because of this sin, because of this curse, death entered the world. But the thing for our purpose this morning is this, what Adam did, we know, did not only affect him, but it affected us.
It affected all of mankind. When Adam sinned, death came into the world and spread to all of his children. Paul writes in Romans 5.12, Through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. We all sinned in Adam as our representative. He tells us in our passage, by a man came death. In Adam, all die. That's the reason why we come into this world. We come under the same curse. It's why we grow old. It's why we get sick. It's why we die. That's why we start out hating God, having an aversion to God, why we don't just automatically go to church and do the right things, and why we are the children of wrath, as Paul tells the Ephesians, like everyone else, because we are under God's just penalty of eternal death. And so we don't think God unfair in holding us accountable for what Adam did as our representative. We do need to remember that God gave us a perfect representative, one whose heart belonged completely to God, and one who knew what his actions would, would result in for all of his children. He had very strong incentives not to sin. If we had been in his place, we would have done exactly the same thing. We explored that was it last Lord's Day evening? We were looking at the difficult question, the origin of evil. I'll refer you uh, to that. But in Adam, Paul says, all die. Okay, we all die in these three ways. Now again, that's the bad news. But Paul tells us there's also good news. He writes this, again, in Hebrew parallelism. Since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. He also writes, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And the point is, Adam killed us, but Christ gives us life. Now we know that God in his infinite love and mercy sent his son to be our savior. Again, the very familiar verse, John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and we know that his name is Jesus, and his name means Jehovah is salvation. He was sent into the world to save his people from their sins. We know that Jesus is God's eternal son, the one who is equal with God. Paul writes in Philippians 2.6, although he, that is Jesus, existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, Okay, so he is in the form of God, he is equal with God, he is God, the Son, eternally, but he became one with us, we know. Paul continues in Philippians 2, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her without sin, so that he might pay the debt that we owed. You know, man owed the debt. We're under God's curse and condemnation. Jesus becomes a man so that he might pay that debt for us. And the way he does it is in two ways. By obeying for us, as I said before, to give us that perfect record of obedience we need, and by suffering and dying in our place to satisfy God's justice and to take away our guilt. And let's not forget, when Jesus was crucified, when he underwent that, that wasn't all that he went through. Now, that would be horrible enough, but oftentimes that's all that you know, Christians think about. When they read about the crucifixion, is, is the, you know, the abuse that he received beforehand, the nails and hanging on the cross and how painful that would be, and it was painful. But notice that the text we read, the two men who were crucified on other, either side of him, they still found enough strength to be able to curse Jesus while they're on the cross, okay? So it's not something we'd want to go through. It's horrible enough. But Jesus suffered far more than that on the cross. He suffered God's full wrath on the cross. Now, here's an interesting note. Jonathan Edwards tells us, you know, when Jesus was praying in the garden, as he's looking forward at the cup that he was about to drink, and we know he's praying, if it's possible, let this cup pass. 
And he begins to sweat. I, I believe the text actually tells us he was sweating blood, which means that he was under great duress because he knew what was ahead of him, not just the crucifixion. I mean, I don't think the, the, the two men who were crucified were, were sweating drops of blood, but Jesus was because he was going to face something far worse than what they were going to face, and that is, again, God's wrath. But looking forward to that and praying that if it's possible, it might pass, Jesus was willing to take it because he knew. He knew that if he didn't drink it, then we would have to. And he knew what that would do to us. He knew that the cup of God's wrath would push us down into hell forever. You see, that, that is a reality. That is what we deserve. But because he loved us, Jesus willingly drank it. He took our guilt on himself and suffered our punishment on the cross out of love for us. So Jesus lived for us. Jesus died for us because he loved us, that he might save us. But what we want to focus on for just a moment is this last point. Jesus was raised for us. Okay, this was also necessary for our salvation. Without it, we would be lost. One thing we don't often understand is the resurrection is so central to the gospel that the apostles' message was often characterized by the preaching of the resurrection. Here's one example. Luke writes in Acts 4, verses 1 and 2. As they, the, the disciples, were speaking to the people, probably um, Peter and John in this case, the priests and the captain of the, of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is a very central, you know, uh, doctrine that's involved in the gospel. That's why Paul is arguing for it in our passage. Let's not forget in the context of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is arguing for the truth of the resurrection against those in Corinth who denied it. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12, he says this, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. You see, there, there were skeptics in, in Corinth. Let's not forget, it was a Greek culture. Greeks, you know, think about Paul on the Areopagus and when he's, you know, talking to the philosophers, they were willing to listen to him until he said, God raised him from the dead. And then that was kind of the end of it because that seemed foolish. You know, the resurrection will, will seem foolish to most people today. Most people believe the resurrection of the dead, that that's something that's impossible. You know, all of us know people who have died. As we get older, we know more and more such people. And we've been to many funerals, but how many times have you seen people raised again from the dead? I would venture to say none of us here have seen any, and neither had anyone in Corinth. Paul is preaching the resurrection of the dead, but that's, that's something that's a, you know, miraculous, something they've never seen before. But just because they hadn't seen it, just because we haven't seen it, doesn't mean that's impossible. Paul begins this chapter by proving it. And that's something R.C. Sproul is going to do this evening in our, in our uh, lecture. You know, how do we answer the skeptics? Well, he, what he does is he points to the many people who saw Jesus after he had been raised from the dead. Well, how many people saw him? Peter, he says. Then the twelve, and he's using the term twelve, but really by that time it was eleven. Then over five hundred at the same time. Mary Magdalene and, and the others who were with her, who saw him at the tomb, and then the two who were on their way to, the, to Emmaus, remember on that road when Jesus appears to them. And when Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, most of these eyewitnesses were still living. And if the Corinthians wanted proof, they could ask them, but let's not forget that Paul was an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ, and he was telling them that he had seen them. He had seen Christ, raised from the dead. That qualified him to be a witness of the resurrection. But then Paul goes on to explain, you know, not only that Jesus is risen, but why is that important? Well, he says, because without it, there's really no good news. There's no gospel. 
And let me just give you his argument in a nutshell. He says, if there's no resurrection, which some in Corinth were saying, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ hasn't been raised, then the, the faith that the Corinthians had in Christ would do them no good. They're still guilty. They're still under condemnation. Then, those who have trusted in Jesus, who have already died, they don't have, a, you know, they're not, they're not alive in heaven. They don't have a resurrection to look forward to. They're in hell. They have perished forever. Then, he says, their hope, everything that they're hoping for from Christ is nothing more than a delusion. And that they, of all mankind, should be pitied because they're duped by such a farce as a resurrected man. Okay? No resurrection means no hope. Now, that's the fact. The question is, why? Why is the resurrection so important? Well, remember, the resurrection is the proof, it is the evidence that the work Jesus did of his life and his death were accepted by the Father on our behalf, actually accepted for Christ on his behalf, okay? Our sins killed Jesus. We need to realize that. Our sins put him in the grave. Now, here's an interesting thought. This also comes from Jonathan Edwards, and we're going to have to think about this for a bit and see if, it, if it's true. But Jonathan Edwards said that if our sins had not been imputed to Jesus, the crucifixion wouldn't have killed him. Death would not be possible for him because only those who have sinned will die. So he was saying with, with, if Jesus had not carried our sins, he would not have been able to die. Now, that, that's an interesting thought. I had never heard that before. Just came in contact with that this week. But that's the way God's justice works. Now, think about this too, and this is something we are familiar with. If he hadn't been raised from the dead, that would mean the payment he made for the sins that killed him would not have been accepted. He would still be burying them and still in the grave, and that means that the payment would not have been made for us. We would still be in our sins, which means all we would have to look forward to is what Paul says, damnation. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, the payment was not accepted. We are still in our sins. But of course, the gospel is, he has been raised. God has accepted his payment or his death, his payment in full. And that's the reason why death can no longer hold him. It's also the reason why it can no longer hold us who trust in him, who look to Jesus alone for salvation. Notice again what Paul says in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. You know, there are those who look at this passage and they say, well, look, Adam killed everyone, Christ made everybody alive. Universal redemption. Everybody's going to be saved. But that's not what Paul's saying. He's saying, in Adam, everyone dies. That's true. But it's only those who are in Christ who are actually going to be made alive made alive in all the ways that we've, um, we've been killed, okay? You have to trust in Christ. They are the ones who are biblically in Christ. The world is not in Christ. Only those who trust Christ are in Him. We all came into this world dead in Adam, but when we look to Christ in faith, and we could only do that by God's grace alone, we became alive in Him. Okay, so now we have the hope having trusted in Jesus that as Christ was raised from the dead, so we will not only be raised now in, in life, there is a spiritual resurrection, which is when the Spirit of God comes into our hearts and we begin to love God again, which is what enables us to trust in Christ. So we will be in the resurrection of the righteous at the end of time when Jesus comes again, and we will be spending eternity with Him in His kingdom. Now, again, this is only for those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone for their salvation. And let's not forget all the things that are true of those who believe in Christ. We need to take that into account as well. But if we're trusting Him and we're being conformed to His image, we are in Christ and we have this to look forward to. And if not, 
We do need to trust Him. Trust Him and Him alone for our salvation. But remember this, Jesus did all of this for us. He rescued us from hell. How much should we love Him? Jesus drank that cup so that we wouldn't have to. We should praise Him for the rest of eternity for that mercy. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And as we think about all these things we've been looking at, let's prepare to come to the table. And again, to rejoice in the death of Christ and what that means, but also what this day represents, His resurrection, remembering that Jesus, through this work, has saved us. Let's, let's pray.